joining me in welcoming uh, Mr. Chad Barman. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's great to see you guys. Um, so I, I think I'm just going to you know, try to keep this real. I'm just going to tell my story. I'm going to talk about the two startups that I've had the, the luck to start uh, and, and grow. And uh, you know, I didn't actually come up with this topic. You know, the, the marketing team at, at Appia said this to me. And uh, you know, if, I'm, if I'm completely honest, you know, the, the truth of it is I'm not in my 20s anymore. I just turned 30. Um, I'd like to think I'm a little bit wiser, uh, a little bit older. Uh, I think uh, you know, I had some family in this weekend and uh, they, they pointed out a gray hair or two. Uh, and so um, you know, sometimes you know, I, I look at this picture and that's sort of how I feel. I've been an entrepreneur now uh, for over a decade. Uh, and you know, I, I saw this on a, a t-shirt once. You know, and I think that uh, the perspective that I have now is so different than, uh, than, than, than when, I, when I first started. But you know, not too long ago, I was uh, young and stupid. Or I like to sort of think of it as crazy. And, and where this all began, uh, you know, it started off as a project. Um, I went to a school just down the road from here for high school. It's a public boarding school called the North Carolina School of Science and Math. It's like going to college two years early. You live in your dorms. And uh, senior year, uh, I came back and uh, I, it, I, I wanted to start a company. Uh, I, I recruited my best friend, uh, one of my good friends, Taylor Brockman, and, and we started work uh, at nights and on the weekends and, and when we would skip class. And, you know, I think that um, you know, we were in this, this dorm called Hunt Dorm. And we experimented with a lot of different ideas. I mean, you know, we had to solve basic problems. Like you know, this was 1999, 1998. Uh, internet wasn't pervasive. Um, it, you know, people didn't have cell phones. We had a pay phone at the end of the hall in our dorm uh, that, that, that we had to use to make calls, uh, whether you're calling home to your parents. Um, to work on our project, we had to obviously get on the internet. And, uh, the, the problem was the dorms weren't wired. I mean, this is way before Wi-Fi, right? This is back when you actually had, you know, T1 lines. Um, and, and, not, and, and so what we actually had to do, uh, not only were the dorms not wired, it was against school rules to have internet in your dorm. I guess they wanted us to study and do work. Um, and so what we did is we drilled a hole through the wall and ran our own T1 <laughs> into the room. Um, and, and, and the problem was word got out that we had the internet. Um, and so we had to set up a firewall, and we had to basically give out uh, internet to our friends to keep them quiet uh, so that we could continue work on, on this project. Um, and uh, you know, we played around with a lot of different ideas. I, I think we had gotten the entrepreneurial bug. It's all we could think about. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think if I look back on it, we maybe worked on three or four different business ideas, um, experimenting, trying things. But the one that kept coming back to us, the one that was interesting is, you know, uh, this was our very first cell phone. Taylor and I got this exact same phone. This would have been 1999. And, you know, it's amazing to look back on it. I still have it on my desk. It's like a brick. It's super heavy. Um, it's got a, a, a black and white, uh, does this work? It's got a, it's got a black and white screen. And, but what was special about this phone, it, it's called the Qualcomm NeoPoint. It was the first phone in the U.S. that could access the internet. Um, and not at all like the iPhones and Androids that we carry now. This was a phone that could access this sort of uh, stick figure-like or DOS-like uh, internet that was called uh, WAP or HDML. This is sort of like internet history. Um, but this phone inspired us. I think we sort of had this belief that everyone was going to have these devices and would be you know, playing games or, or surfing the internet. And, and the idea that we came up with was to build uh, a search engine. And so it turns out that in our dorm room at the, the School of Science and Math, we started work on this project, uh, which ultimately became Matricity. And, and it all started around this phone and you know, it, our illegally wired dorm room and building the first search engine for these very, very early, I almost think of them as prototype, but early cell phones in, in the US. Um, and I, you know, to compress a, a really long story, uh, you know, we uh, graduated senior year. Uh, we uh, raised a little bit of capital. If you're, if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, it's called the friends and family round. You know, from the payphone at the end of the hall, um, I convinced my grandmother and my partner Taylor's dad uh, to give us $50,000. And that was enough to say, let's keep working on this during the summer. Uh, you know, we hired a couple of our friends. Uh, you know, we're doing all this while we're also trying to find a date for the prom and, and apply to colleges. Um, you know, we, we got our college acceptance letters in the mail. 
but uh, I want to look at, if you look at this chart, this is a graph of the NASDAQ. Um, and you know, the, the, the dot-com bubble, the, the NASDAQ peaked in you know, February or March of 2000. And uh, you know, as, as luck would have it, uh, we were able to raise a first round of funding around this idea of the wireless search engine. Uh, we raised uh, about $5 million in venture capital, two 18-year-old kids, uh, fresh out of high school, uh, college acceptances on hold. Uh, obviously, we had no idea that the market was about to peak. Um, but we were able to raise $5 million before the you know, proverbial dot-com bubble burst. Um, and, and we were in business. Um, and if you, <laughs> this is a little bit of internet history. This is this famous sock puppet, uh, sock, sock puppet that, that Pets.com came out with. Um, and it, it sort of came to symbolize the, the crazy exuberance of the internet era. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll fast forward. You know, we, we raised this venture capital. Uh, a year and a half went by, and uh, we were too early. We weren't able to find customers. Um, the cell phones uh, didn't really work. I mean, no one was interested in this DOS-like experience on the, uh, the internet. I mean, people were still coming onto the internet on the actual web with PCs. You know, high-speed internet hadn't even come about. Um, and you know, we'd, we hired a lot of people. We, we were desperately trying to figure out a way to make this wireless search engine work. We, we were such believers in the opportunity, um, but we ran out of money. Uh, it's amazing when I look back on this. I mean, this is a startup that should have failed. You know, if I, if I go back, I mean, the, the, the bubble burst. At this point, you know, we're somewhere like in, in the, on the time continuum, we're like somewhere here. So the market's crashed almost as bad as 1929. Uh, we've honestly, we've blown through our five million of venture capital. We've got a, a really cool wireless search engine. Um, but there really isn't that much content to index in the search engine. Uh, we had significantly less than a million dollars in revenue, so the expenses we were spending were far greater than the capital we'd raised. Uh, we were down to our last two weeks of cash, I remember, because I wasn't sure how we were going to make the next payroll. And we had a board meeting uh, on September 11th, 2001. Uh, and I was desperately, on the agenda, I was you know, basically preparing to plead with these venture capitalists who had given us the $5 million dollars at the peak of the market to give us another shot, you know, invest a little bit more. I, I just said, it's the phones, they're, they, they're just not there yet. Um, and about an hour into the board meeting is, you know, when the planes hit. Uh, so talk about crazy timing. Um, we obviously ended the meeting. At that point, I sort of looked at myself and I said, my startup career is over. Um, I had, you know, uh, gotten an acceptance to Stanford, but I had deferred. So I'd taken, you know, at this point, it'd been a year and a half, so I'd taken almost two years off from college. Mentally, the, the minute we, we heard the second plane hit, I sort of said, you know what, I'm going back to college, it's over. Um, and, you know, to make the decision even harder, um, you know, uh, Stanford changed their rules. Because during the dot-com days, they basically let anybody take time off from college to pursue these things. But the dot-com bubble had burst. And there was a new president at Stanford and uh, about two or three days after this happened, you know, I got a, call, a letter from Stanford that said, if you don't come, uh, Stanford starts like a month later. So they start at the end of September. And they basically said, if you don't enroll this fall, you lose your place and you'll have to reapply. Um, and, and what's a little crazy as an entrepreneur is I'm actually a pretty risk averse guy. I don't like taking risks, um, certainly with my own life, right? Um, a lot of what gave me the confidence to pursue this startup project uh, was that I felt my downside was hedged a little bit. Because if it failed, I could go to Stanford and get a good education, right? Um, but this changed everything. And, and obviously, I couldn't stand the thought of failure and giving up on something I'd invested at this point. I guess two years of my life, we'd spent over $5 million in venture capital. We were the first wireless search engine. I think we had, at least in our mind, a chance to be the Google of this mobile internet, right? Um, we'd hired, I think, 40 people at that point. Um, and, and they were all being faced with the, ch the potential of losing their jobs. Um, and so I did the only thing that I thought I could do. I, uh, I enrolled at Stanford. I, I booked a flight. Um, I basically, I gave up. Um, I moved into the dorm. Uh, this is a picture of Stanford. Uh, I, you know, I, I moved into a quad uh, in a dorm called Robley. It's the old dorm at Stanford. Um, it didn't feel right. I was going through orientation. I felt like a quitter. I was emailing back with my investors. They were calling me like, are you kidding? You're quitting? 
But I said, are you guys going to write me another check? We're out of money. I mean, it was a real tense time. Um, I was trying to register for classes. I had no idea what I wanted to take. Um, I thought I'd figured out what I wanted to do with my life, to be an entrepreneur, and yet it was all up in smokes, right? Um, but then, then a crazy thing happened. So you know, about three weeks in, it's the first day of class. And uh, yeah, I remember this like it was yesterday, because you know, my roommate, Matt, had set his alarm to go off to wake us up at 7 o'clock. Um, and instead of like the beep, beep, beep that I was accustomed to, it was some bizarre music. It sounded like it was from Japan or something. I, and I said, Matt, what, what the hell is that? And uh, he, he threw me the, the alarm clock. Except uh, it wasn't an alarm clock. It was a phone. Uh, he had come back from a summer exchange program in Japan. Uh, and he had met a girl while he was there, you know, summer before his freshman year. And as he's leaving on his flight to come home, to come to Stanford, the girl says, I want you to remember me. And she takes her phone out of her pocket and hands it to him, to Matt. And he takes it with him to remember her. And, and this is a picture of that phone. It was a pink clamshell phone, color screen. It could play games, could download ringtones. It had an app that he was using as his alarm clock to play karaoke music. And that's what woke us up on the first day of class. And for me, I was already wrestling with uh, quitting, with giving up. Um, this was like a sign. I mean, you know, uh, and I, I sort of said, wait a second. Yeah, this is crazy. This is like holding a phone from the future. I mean, remember that black and white phone? I still had that black and white phone in my pocket. So here I am holding this brick of a phone, which was the top of the line phone really in the US at this point. Here I am holding this like sleek phone, which is, you know, looks Byzantine compared to the iPhones we're holding now. But you got to remember, this is 2001. Um, this was like a phone from the future. And it, you know, it was a, it, what we called an iMode phone from NTT Docomo in Japan. And I basically said, Matt, I need to borrow that phone. Um, and I spent the, 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 the next couple of weeks, which turned into months, um, you know, taking that phone and a PowerPoint deck and talking to every investor I could get a meeting with. Um, I, I just didn't want to give up. This was too strong of a sign. Uh, you know, it sort of uh, it fueled my deepest conviction that we had the right idea. We were just too, um, too early, maybe. Um, the other thing is, it's important too. I mean, again, I'm pretty risk averse. Uh, while I'm doing all this, I'm also pleading with the administration to give me another chance. Like, give me another year. Give me another semester. Absolutely not. Um, but I, I went around the president to the registrar's office. And she said, there's a loophole the way they wrote the rules. If you enroll in class and go for one day, I'll let you stop out. And you can take a leave of absence. And that'll hold your spot. That was all I wanted to hear, right? So I, I uh, went for one day to Stanford, <laughs> took a leave of absence. And basically, uh, I think I left my stuff in the dorm. I was just flying around, to basically trying to get a meeting with anybody I could. It turns out there's a road that runs next to Stanford. It's a big reason why Silicon Valley exists out there. There's a road that runs on the north edge of campus called Sand Hill Road. Uh, and that's where you know, almost every venture capitalist in the world has an outpost there. There's about an estimated $50 billion of capital in those hills. And I, I went uh, essentially uh, door to door to anyone who would take a meeting. Uh, to, to, and I, I just showed him this phone and I said, this is going to happen in the US. People are going to start downloading apps and games, at ringtones. It's just a matter of these phones catching up. Um, 58. That's how many people said no. That's how many VCs I pitched, showed that phone to, gave, gave the best sales pitch I could you know, with as much passion as I could muster. And I got no after no after no. Um, you know, I, I think the most common thing that people said is, that's a great phone, but what's happening in Japan is a little, it's an isolated case. And in Japan, they've got trains. You know, people are on the train an hour a day. So that's why they're sending all these texts and downloading stuff. I would say, no, it's the phone. Well, then they said, well, the, the phones are never going to happen here in the US. The reason the phones are as good as they are in Japan is because it's sort of vertically integrated. The carrier controls more of the value chain. Um, some people said, you're 19 years old. No. Uh, I got a lot of no's, um, but the 59th meeting was a yes, and the 60th meeting was a yes. Um, and, and that was the beginning of sort of a, a new start. Uh, it ended up being $14 million of additional capital that we were able to raise. Um, the first yes was a firm, ironically not in California, called Massey Birch Capital. They're no longer around. Uh, they're probably most famous for being the original guy to back the Colonel back in the 60s. 
which is why we have KFC. <laughs> um, and they also invested in this little thing called AOL and did pretty well. Um, the other investor that said yes was NEA, which you probably not heard of, but you know, most recently, they're the guys that were the original investor in Groupon. Um, and so that was the, that gave us new life. Um, and with that funding, we expanded from the wireless search to build more of a platform. It was really emulated around what we were seeing in Japan. Um, NTT Docomo had built this thing called iMode. It was more than just search. It was about apps and games and especially ringtones. Um, and so we built a platform like that and went around to every phone company that would take a meeting with us and said, let us power your platform. Um, and, uh, you know, we were still early. We were dangerously spending that venture capital that we'd raised, obviously with the lesson of how close we came to failure, being down to our last two weeks of cash. Um, but we had to invest, and we kept trying to convince these phone companies, and we were still getting a lot of resistance. Our lucky break uh, came from Singular, if you remember those guys, raising the bar. Um, and they believed enough in this you know, small, I think, 40 or 50 person company at that point from North Carolina that they cut a deal with us to power uh, the, the ringtone and games platform uh, for Singular. And uh, that was the turning point for us. Uh, uh, that, that was the deal that you know, put us on the map. Uh, and I remember we launched in, it was December of 2004. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you remember, there used to be this IBM commercial about you know, people launching a website, a dot com. And, and they would launch it, and then one order would come in, and then two orders would come in, and then an hour later, 100 orders would come in, and then within a matter of hours, they were getting flooded with, or, with orders, and their servers crashed. Um, well, that's what happened to us. We turned on this ringtone store for Singular. Within four hours, our servers were completely overloaded. Uh, we crashed so hard, we were down for two weeks um, as we tried to like, figure out what to do, how to re-engineer it. Uh, fortunately, Singular said, we're giving you one more shot. Um, and it was December 16th. 2004. And, you know, I remember like it was yesterday, we flipped the switch, turned it back on. We knew this was our whole careers, our whole entrepreneurial life on the line. Um, and the servers were able to hold the volume. That first day um, was a million dollars of ringtone sales. Um, and that was just the beginning. Uh, you know, we launched sort of towards the end of the year in 04. We ended up doing 28 million that first year, all in December. Um, and then this phone came out in 2005 called the Motorola Razor. Any of you guys have a Razor? Do you remember that? I heard they're coming back with like a droid version of it. Um, and uh, that, that was the first phone in the US that looked like that phone that my roommate had at Stanford. And this is a chart of the ringtone sales that we powered. Uh, we expanded from Singular to about a dozen phone companies, almost all in the U.S. and Canada, you know, from AT&T to Verizon. Um, by 08, a uh, billion dollars. That was the peak year. And, and we got super lucky, um, extremely fortunate. Uh, Matricity was able to go public, uh, traded as high as uh, you know, a billion two in market cap. Um, this is a picture of us uh, on the left, that's Taylor, one of the other co-founders, that's us celebrating after. Um, and it, but, but you know, it, timing is, is everything. Uh, this is a chart of sort of the past year, so you know, you have to get really uh, lucky. You know, I think uh, you know, tech is very hard, I, I'm being very honest, this is the chart. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of look at it and say that uh, when I look back on this, this, this is a company that probably should have gone out of business, probably shouldn't have left the dorm room. Uh, on 9-11, when I gave up and went back to Stanford, that probably should have been the end of the chapter, but we kept fighting. You know, we didn't, we didn't want to give up. We believed in this vision. Um, yeah, another version of it, it, you know, Thomas Jefferson, this is probably a quote you've seen. You know, sometimes it's about, you know, being in the right place at the right time. I like to say you make your own luck because you work hard. Uh, and, you know, at some point, you find yourself in a very fortunate spot. Um, timing, timing is everything. Uh, okay, so, you know, part of it for me as an entrepreneur, realizing how extraordinarily lucky we got, uh, is, is, you know, trying to see, can I do it again? And uh, I'm now working on my second startup, Appia. Uh, and it's, you know, 
uh, you know, on, the, on sort of the theme of luck. I mean, this is actually our office. So we're in downtown Durham. If you've ever been to a Durham Bulls game uh, and you've looked out sort of over the stadium, you see the, the smokestack. That's our building. We're the top two floors there. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, when, we, when we started uh, working on this project, you know, I, it, uh, Matricity had gotten up to over 500 employees. You know, we had offices all over the, the world. Things got a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, I was, uh, after nine years, kind of thinking, gosh, I'd like to do another startup and start all over and try it again. Um, and I, I got really lucky because the original investors in Motricity, the guys that had given me that original $5 million investment at the top of the NASDAQ, uh, said, here's a blank check. Do you have any ideas for another startup? Um, and when we started sort of uh, working on this project, that month is when Apple launched this thing called the App Store. And, and as with almost everything that, that Apple has done, you know, it's, uh, you know, they take an idea that's sort of been out there, but they perfect it. They make it beautiful. They make it amazing. And I think when we saw the App Store, I mean, in a lot of ways, it was similar to what Docomo had been doing in Japan, or even what we'd been doing sort of with vending ringtones and Java game downloads at Matricity. Uh, but it was like a light bulb went off. And we sort of said, wow, this has a chance to be you know, pretty big. We, we weren't sure. Maybe not as big as ringtones. I remember we said that. But obviously, it's proven to be a heck of a lot bigger. Um, and, uh, and we said, well, we, we know a thing or two about how to sort of build an app store. It's a, it's a similar technology problem. Um, and, and so we embarked with Appia to do what we'd done for ringtones for apps, uh, to build app stores, to partner with. There's 800 phone companies in the world. Uh, with Matricity, all of our ringtones, I think we estimated 70% of every ringtone that was ever downloaded in the US came through our servers. Um, but we were really only in the US and Canada a little bit. And, and I think with apps, we sort of felt this is a global thing. Let's try to do this on a global basis. And so. You know, we, we set out to build basically like a, a highway for developers to reach distribution, to build an app store for all of the non-iPhone phones that are out there. And, um, and, you know, we've been able to get backing from some incredible VCs. You know, I think the key is when you start up a startup, you have to have venture capital. That, that's the, that was the difference between life and death. You know, the running out of money with two weeks to go and not. Um, and so far, the people that have you know, backed us at, at Appia. Uh, I mentioned the first two uh, investors in Motricity gave us capital, uh, but uh, we've also raised capital from Eric Schmidt, who's the chairman of Google, uh, from BlackBerry, uh, from Venrock. Venrock is the, one of the oldest venture capital firms that was started by the Rockefeller family. And, and a, a little bit of venture capital trivia is they were the original investor in Apple way back in the 70s. Um, and so we all share this belief in an open app store um, and sort of leveraging the combined power of all the carriers and handset makers that want to give, uh, at some level, I guess, Apple and Google a run for their money and, and not. Um, and, and so where we are right now, you know, it's, uh, it's still early days uh, for us as a startup working out of Durham. Um, we, have, we are now powering uh, 40 app stores for carriers, handset makers, browser companies, and portals. Um, you know, this month, 33 million uh, visits to the App Store that we're powering, uh, about 100 million page views, about, uh, we're doing about a million downloads a day. Um, and, you know, I think just to put some context around that traffic, you know, we, we like to, you know, joke about this. We like to think about the world as a risk board, so this is like North America on the risk board. Um, and, you know, it, right now, based on our traffic, we'd be about the 36th largest country in the world, about the size of Canada. Um, and, and, the, and the model is that we basically provide a way for developers that have built an Android app or a Java app or really any app for any phone. We support 3,500 different phones uh, across every operating system, but we give a way for developers that have built an app to come to us and get distribution beyond the Apple App Store or Android market. Um, and, you know, we have a long way to go, but at this point, you know, in the past year, we've gone from essentially irrelevance to the number six app store in the world uh, as measured by traffic and downloads. Um, we're the second largest independent app store and, you know, we think that if we continue to sign up carrier partners and handset makers, you know, we have a shot to, to you know, hopefully be one of the top three, uh, you know, in the next year or so. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard of TechCrunch, they're a blog in the, in the tech industry, but they did something, I think this was last month, which looked at the top six app stores and, and sort of measured the growth rates year over year. So we're the fastest growing, uh, but still a small guy um, with a lot of ambition. Um, and this is a chart that shows, you know, since we started this, what was initially a project and has turned into, you know, startup number two, 
Um, this is our traffic cumulatively since we started. So it took us 34 months to reach 100 million app downloads. Uh, we've added the next 100 million downloads in four months. Um, and we're, on a, we're probably a week or two away from hitting 300 million downloads so far. So, you know, fingers crossed, it's starting to work, um, we think. Uh, and, you know, one thing is, you know, uh, you know, I mentioned like at Motricity, all of our downloads and all these ringtones that people were downloading were coming, you know, from all of us here in the U.S. Um, and Canada. Well, our, our number one country for Appia is India. Um, I was there earlier this year meeting with a bunch of the phone companies over there. Um, this is the, the Taj. Um, the U.S. is our second largest country, uh, but is only about 10% of our traffic. Um, so we have downloads happening in 200, well, I guess it said 175 countries. It's almost 200 countries around the world. Um, and, and the reason that I think India is pretty interesting is there are 865 million uh, mobile phone users right now in India. That's about two and a half times the number of people in the United States, okay? Just to put some scale around it. Um, and this is a, a chart that might be a little bit hard to see, but the three lines, the blue line is the United States. So you can see the U.S., uh, and, and it's a little bit of a forecast, right? I think actual time is here. I should have probably drawn a line. This is a forecast. But like, right now, the U.S. is just at 300 million um, uh, mobile phone users. You know, but uh, the, the, the interesting thing for me is that uh, India is set to overtake China, at least if you believe this forecast. Um, it's, growing, it's growing explosively. There's 15 carriers. They're adding uh, about 20 million mobile phone users a month. Um, and I'm trying to think about that, to put that in scale. Uh, it's a little bit smaller than T-Mobile, but it's almost like they're adding a T-Mobile every month, right? You know, uh, obviously, there's a, a limit to that, right? It's starting to be concave down, I guess. Um, um, and, and we're also continuing to sign up partners that are looking to have their own app store powered by Appia. Um, we are thrilled to have just won two of the largest carriers in the world. Uh, you might not have heard about them because they're not really here in the U.S., at least directly. Um, although Vodafone does own a, a chunk of Verizon. Uh, but Vodafone and America Mobile. Um, um, Vodafone is the third largest carrier in the world. Uh, America Mobile is Carlos Slim's empire in Latin America. Um, so they are the number one or number two carrier in 17 countries from Mexico to Argentina. Um, you know, back to the risk board analogy. Uh, we are moving quite a lot of armies into some of these emerging markets like India and South America um, and, and hoping that that increases our traffic another order of magnitude. Um, and so uh, just to close, I, I thought I would talk about why I'm interested in this, why I think this is an interesting project. Um, you know, part of this is about, I, the truth of it is I love being an entrepreneur. I think the best part about, you know, Motricity having some level of success, being able to go public, is that it's given me the freedom to do this. I'm extremely risk averse, right? Um, I, uh, for the longest time, I think right up until about the point that Motricity filed to go public, I always thought in the back of my head, I might have to go back to Stanford. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, it, what I love is having the freedom to be able to do this and to experiment, uh, whether Appia succeeds or fails. Um, uh, and why I think this space is so interesting is the, the, the scale, the magnitude of this. So these are some interesting stats, I thought, right? You know, there's a billion cars out there. You know, there's 1.1 billion phones. Uh, there's 2 billion internet users, right? This is a stat that, if you follow Mary Meeker's research, came out, you know, that, and that's, I think, pretty interesting. Um, but there's 5.6 billion mobile phone users now, right? So, I mean, think about that, right? Bigger than all of those industries. Uh, and, it, and this is an industry that didn't exist when I was in high school. Um, now let's think about that in the context of the world. There's seven billion people. There's almost a cell phone for every person on the planet. It's the most crazy feeling in the world to go to a country like India and to see everyone. Everyone has a cell phone. Um, it's, a, it's a mark of distinction. It's, it's a communication tool. It's, it's a life-changing thing. It's the first way that people in a lot of countries access the internet. And it's no longer the DOS internet, right? You know, we've been talking for so long about how do we get a computer, uh, even better, a computer with the internet, uh, in the emerging market for under $200. Uh, and, and no matter how they re-engineered laptops or came up with netbooks, they couldn't figure out a way to do that. Well, that day's come. It's called an Android phone. Uh, and the price is approaching zero. Okay, another way that I like to think about this is, you know, think about the computer revolution. 
if you add up, you know, start with like the Apple IIc and just start adding cumulatively every computer that's ever shipped, every computer, every laptop, every iPad uh, that's in use right now, it's 1.2 billion. So sort of like three decades of this computer revolution, we're talking about an order of magnitude of a billion, a billion two uh, devices. Um, but 1.6 billion phones will ship in 2011. So it's like you know, one year is three decades of the PC industry. That's what gets me excited. Um, and, and the processor in the phone that, that all of us are carrying right now is more powerful than at this point probably your third generation of computer that you've had. Um, and so the potential for this, for a device that's with you all the time. Uh, when I go on vacation now, I have to get to a point where I, like, I turn my phone off or I leave it in the car or something. You know, it's the only way to, to relax. Uh, they have become devices we can't live without. Um, and they're replacing every other device that we carry with us. Uh, and, and frankly, that's what, that's what gets me excited with, uh, with Appia. So thank you for listening to the story. It's the story in progress. And I'd love, I know we have a little bit more time. I, I'd love to uh, answer any questions as openly as I can. Yeah, so the, the question is who have been the most valuable tech players and you know, how have they contributed to my success? And I'll start with a confession. Uh, I am not that uh, good at programming. I'm not that technical. I mean, I'm okay. I, I played around. I did a little bit of coding. But it became really apparent at 17, 18 years old that I wasn't as good as everybody else, especially as once I entered the, the, the world of entrepreneurship. You know, any, any graduate you know, coming out of school had better programming chops than me. Um, and, and the truth of it is, when we started uh, the first project, uh, when we started work on that, uh, I started the, by recruiting Taylor, my friend, so the guy who was in that picture. Uh, it turns out, at least my year at science and math, he was the smartest technical talent in the school. Um, and so he was my very first recruit. I think a big thing about being an entrepreneur is knowing your weaknesses and hiring the best people uh, for any of those things. A lot of times, it's such an easy tendency to hire someone that maybe isn't uh, better than you or something. It's like human nature, but you've got to hire the best people. And I think the, other, the second point I'll say to that is that uh, at both Motricity and Appia, uh, you know, we have had a programming test, a technical test of some kind, you know, for every engineer we've ever hired. Um, and so we, we you know, definitely try to get the best people. Um, so the question is about Y Combinator um, and, and sort of incubators versus cold calling VCs. A uh, couple thoughts there. First point is huge congrats. Um, the amount of applications to Y Combinator uh, from everything I've read has gone through the roof. And I think the acceptance rates there are astronomically, uh, insanely difficult. I think I've heard like 3% actually make it in. Um, so, uh, and Y Combinator is the best of the best. I mean, even within all the incubators, uh, you know, Y Combinator, tech stars, and it starts to drop off from there. But any incubator is great, uh, because raising capital is all about a network. Um, you know, I skipped over a lot of this, but so we raised uh, the 50K uh, to get going on day one from Taylor's dad and my grandmother, from the payphone at the end of the hall. Uh, but that was pretty much where our network stopped. Uh, LinkedIn didn't exist. Facebook was a figment of Mark's imagination. Uh, and our real world network consisted of our teachers at the School of Science and Math. And I remember asking my history teacher, how do you raise venture capital? And he basically said, go to Google. Um, and so the first thing we did is we built this business plan and a PowerPoint for this idea. Uh, we downloaded a list of venture capital firms, mailed out our business plan to them, and waited. We didn't get a single call back, not a single one. I later raised money 
from some of the firms that I had sent the plan to, um, and they didn't even look at it. Uh, because the way the venture capital world, the way that life works, but the way the venture capital world works is it's all about contacts and introductions in your network. And we literally started from square one. But every time we would get a, a, a meeting, we, for whatever purpose, we sort of viewed that meeting as our entire future depended on that meeting. And, and, and we would try to sell everyone on our vision. And, and then the idea would be, you know, even if they didn't invest, they might know three people they could introduce us to. The beauty of these incubators is they come with a network. So if you can actually get in, it's a huge head start. And there's some trade-offs in terms of equity maybe and how to structure your deal. But you know, ultimately, uh, if you can get in a great incubator, that's a humongous uh, head start. Yes? Uh, I want to ask you a question about your first time management. Usually, the only way to uh, entrepreneur or solve a student is to be a dropout. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way to, so the question is, is the only way to be an entrepreneur <laughs> to be a dropout? I mean, there's certainly a theme of that, right? We see that a lot. Yeah. I think flip it on its head a little bit. Like, entrepreneurship is one of those rare fields where you don't have to have a college degree, right? Um, I mean, trust me, I take education pretty seriously. It took me two years for my parents to sort of think what I was doing was at all worthwhile, right? I mean, they were both, my parents were both teachers. So imagine, you know, Stanford acceptance letter was the happiest day of their life, and I shunned it, right? So that was a horrible day, right? Um, and I think that there is an element of entrepreneur uh, that you see a little bit of craziness, a little bit of like, you know, it's okay to break the rules, right? Uh, I mean, heck, we drilled a uh, hole uh, through our dorm room wall just to illegally wire our rooms up. So breaking rules is good. But I, I think that um, part of it's about having the right idea. I think the bigger reason you see that is that starting a company involves a crazy amount of risk. And when you're older and you have a mortgage or a wife or a husband or kids or something, you know, you can't take those risks anymore. And so it's just easier to start when, uh, when you're young. Um, I'm sure that just like I, could, I always felt I could go back to Stanford. You know, the countless other entrepreneurs that you've heard, uh, whether they left uh, NC State or, or Harvard, you know, they, they, they all felt they could go back and finish their degree because that is a level of certainty uh, in your future. Yes? Yes. So the question is, you know, at Metricity by the second year, we'd gotten to 40 employees. Was it mostly technical? What was sort of the mix? I would say it's probably 50% uh, technical. Um, I'll also say that uh, ramping to 40 employees before you figured out your business model is probably not the best idea. Uh, I think that, you know, it's amazing uh, how close to failure we came. And I think one of the most important lessons is you don't want to scale too quickly. Just because you've raised $5 million in venture capital, you know. Um, so that's one of the things I would look back and say maybe that was a mistake, uh, but we managed to survive. Yes, in the back. So when you give out your business plan, uh, without any sort of previous venture capital from Raven or Trade Bank, maybe your plan might be taken over by a business without any actively putting out any benefit to you. So the question is, you know, as I'm pitching all these investors, the, whether it's the 58 that said no or the countless investors I've met with over the years, was I scared they would steal my idea? Um, and, and sure, it's something I thought about at the time, but I'll just tell you, looking back, uh, you, you have to trust them. A, 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 at the end of the day, if you can't raise capital, you're not going to win. Uh, and, and the truth of it is, uh, VCs are different than entrepreneurs. If they were entrepreneurs, they wouldn't be VCs. They'd have started something. I mean, sometimes you see past entrepreneurs become VCs, but you know, rarely do they become VCs and go back to being an entrepreneur. Um, there's a, a famous story that some of you may have heard uh, do you remember Hotmail, right? I, guess, I mean, they're still around. Uh, but uh, the, the guys that had founded Hot, the, right before they, they launched it, they were looking for their first round of venture capital. And uh, they pitched you know, a bunch of VCs in the valley. And they were going door to door, just like I was showing my phone. Um, but they had a completely different business plan they were pitching. Some kind of database thing. Not a very good idea. <coughs> and they were pitching that, hoping they would get the, the million dollars of venture capital. But then secretly, they were going to go build Hotmail, because that's what they really wanted to do. And they didn't trust the VCs. They thought, this is such a great idea. If we tell them, uh, we'll never get it. Well, they finally met a, a well-known venture capital firm called Draper Fisher Jurvetson, DFJ. And the, the partner at DFJ heard the pitch for the database thing and said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. 
but I, I like you. You seem really passionate, really energetic. Do you have any other ideas? And just the way he said it, the founders of Hotmail trusted him. And that, that's the only firm they told the idea to. And on the spot, they got a check for $100,000. So you know, at some level, you have to trust people. You're not going to get anywhere in life if you don't trust people. And, and you will get burned some, and you will get hurt. But you have to trust. Yes? So comparing your experiences between Microsoft and what's happening at Appio, you've got into the sales arm, you've been able to last as long. Are you finding in your situation that there are things that were truly successful with Appio? I mean, with Microsoft that you try to replicate and they're not successful with Appio and vice versa? I mean, I, I, the question is sort of, you know, have I been able to pick up from Motricity any of the mistakes and learn from them? And, uh, sort of parlay that into what we're doing at, at Appia. And I think uh, that's certainly the hope. I, I think that we're moving at a faster velocity. I mean, um, sometimes I used to joke that Motricity was a really expensive MBA for me uh, because I, I felt like we were making so many mistakes. We didn't know what we were doing. I mean, yet we ended up building a company that was able to get to over a billion dollar valuation. But uh, it was a long road. Um, we, we were, we, I think we had a, a great idea, but we were probably three or four years too early. And that's the kiss of death sometimes. Timing is everything. Um, and, uh, and technology is hard. Things move so quickly. I think at, um, at Appia, we've tried to be you know, super focused. We haven't ramped quite as fast. Um, and I think the, the velocity of traffic is growing at a much faster pace. Um, and so uh, it, it's exciting. But I think you know, uh, even though we're seeing some really good early results, we don't take success for granted. If anything, um, every day we're sort of debating internally, you know, what's going to be the next thing that kills us. And uh, we have a, a real uh, fear of failure. Yes? I have not fear. Uh, what do you think are the biggest important skills you have as a new start in any startup company? As an entrepreneur, what are the, 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 the kinds of skills that you want to see? Um, Look, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, you already know it. Uh, you know, I think that it's not uh, something that can specifically be learned. Uh, truth be told, when I was at the School of Science and Math, I was convinced I was going to be a doctor or maybe a, a researcher. Or I spent some time as an architect. Like, I was playing around with all these different ideas, um, mostly doctor. I, think that's, I thought I was going to go to med school. Uh, <coughs> And I almost, uh, I think at some point in, the, in sort of the continuum, I found myself realizing that in my spare time, in my free time, um, even in time when I should have been working on school stuff, all I was doing was, was trying to think of the next startup and experimenting with an idea. I mean, it was sort of consuming. It was all I would read about. It's all I would do. It was like you know, a hobby on steroids. And I think, um, it, so it sort of found me. Yes. Is there a thing that you really need to do to get the deal from one day in startup so that a customer is not going to choose you for who you are and give you the vision and see the vision for the company and just run by into the next one? So the question is, is, is there an optimal number of people to sort of make decisions and um, how do you sort of manage that? And uh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, uh, at, at Appia, I hesitate to almost say this, but it's a bit more of a, a dictatorial style. Like I, I think I'm preferring to, to, to make the decisions uh, much more unilaterally. Uh, I think that at the same time, you know, we have a management team. Uh, the way we run the company, we have uh, a meeting every Tuesday morning uh, with the, the key leaders of the company. We do a quarterly offsite. Um, I, you know, but I, I think that if you have too many cooks in the kitchen, especially in an early startup, that can be the, the kiss of death. At the end of the day, the lead entrepreneurs got to make the, the tough decisions about focus, about what you're doing, about what the priorities are. If you spend too much time debating those, uh, the time is ticking and the, the clock expires. Yes?
so the, the question is, you know, sort of what's the role of an MBA or professional business training uh, for an entrepreneur? Uh, that's a great question. And I, I certainly uh, don't think there's an absolute rule. But I think that if you were to graph it and put entrepreneurs on one axis and sort of uh, degrees on the other, you would see a correlation that entrepreneurs typically don't have MBAs. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, but that said, we have a ton of MBAs working at Appia, and we certainly had a ton of MBAs uh, working at um, Motricity. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, if you are an entrepreneur, but you're not sure what you want to do, there's nothing wrong with getting more degrees. But I sort of feel like an entrepreneur, uh, if anything, maybe it's a character flaw. Entrepreneurs have a tendency to just jump in. Right? We jump right into the pool. I mean, and I think that that's, the, that's, that's part of the, I, I will say when I look back, though, I think having some basic financial training can be helpful. Um, you know, I hired a, a controller, sort of a part-time CFO pretty early on. Um, I, I look back and think it might have been helpful to have, uh, you know, a bit of basic sort of financial accounting, you know, how to read a balance sheet, that kind of thing. The other thing is, and I, I learned this maybe a year or two in, but I didn't quite appreciate the importance of sales, um, selling. Um, basic stuff, at least in hindsight, but pipeline, selling. Uh, you know, the, and I'm not just talking about customers. But when you think about what an entrepreneur has to do, even if you're the, the technical genius, I mean, at the end of the day, an entrepreneur has to be gifted at selling. Because you have to sell your partner to join you. Uh, you have to sell those first couple of customers to come on board, right? Because you don't have a sales team. Um, and especially, you have to be able to convince investors to invest in you. And that is a sales process. Yes? What would you say to an entrepreneur um, who seems to have trouble staying focused, to organize, and is trying to figure out how to set goals and follow through with that? Um, so the question is, you know, what do you do if you're an entrepreneur and you're having trouble staying focused? Uh, you know, uh, how do you set goals? How do you, how do you uh, organization? And I'll assume for that question that like it's not a, a lack of ambition because I think every entrepreneur is super uh, ambitious. I think that you know organization's tough. Uh, I think that uh, you know it's it's the, the, for me at least. I'll just speak from my experience. Like the hardest thing for me is prioritization, I, or not so much the hardest thing as it is just a real a cognizance of just how important prioritization is. And the, the, the flip side to that is the curse, for me, of a realization that you can't do everything. And what that means is, inevitably, a lot of stuff's going to fall on the ground and break, um, you know, whether it's part of your startup or outside of it. And uh, that prioritization is, is really tough. So like, the only thing I can say is to be successful as an entrepreneur requires an almost uh, insane uh, rigor in prioritization. And uh, that is probably the most important lesson I learned, uh, the hardest thing to do. Um, and, and specifically, like, as it relates to Appy or Motricity, the, the exercise we do is we like, put it all on the whiteboard or on a spreadsheet or something. And we're, we spend a lot of time focusing on identifying the top three things and consciously forcing ourselves to ignore everything else and doing that all the time, uh, weekly, actually. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so the, the question is, uh, when we started work on Matricity and the, the, the Ringtone platform, which was modeled after the Docomo iMode, what kind of IP issues did we sort of run into or, or think about? And, um, so we didn't run into any issues with patents being out there. Might have just gotten lucky. Uh, might have been the fact that we started so freaking early uh, before ringtones even existed you know, uh, outside of Japan and, and maybe Finland. Or, you know, so I think part of it was time. Um, so I don't know if our experience is like an exception or the rule. Um, specifically with our IP and building this platform, we didn't do a great job of IP protection. Um, part of it is when we started, we didn't feel like we could afford to. It's expensive. Um, I think when it was all said and done, we might have had eight patents out there. Uh, I'm only aware of one of my patents that actually got issued. Um, you know, it's, it's tough to, to get a patent all the way through. And I think, uh, for better or worse, this is probably horrible advice. So take this with a grain of salt. But uh, by the time my first patent got issued, the ringtone wars were already over. 
Um, you know, we'd already sold $3 billion of them, and the, the, the curve of ringtone sales had started to decline. So the, the, the thing is, like, getting a patent issued and going through the whole process of getting it, you know, sometimes it's too late, I guess. And I, I think as technology continues to move so quickly, you know, that becomes challenging. So some of the IP issues that we really did encounter a bit more aggressively were with the music labels. Uh, because the, all of the, uh, and this was actually a slightly big problem, because here we were, all these ringtone downloads, but it, you know, there were cases where people figured out how to hack in and steal all the music. Um, and there were some issues around who owed the money to the artists and things like that. Um, there were uh, also cases where the ringtone would be downloaded by the user, uh, but we couldn't collect the money. Um, the most common case back then was either a problem with the carrier's billing system or someone was like on a prepay account and actually didn't have the funds, but we were still letting the ringtone get downloaded. That kind of stuff happened. And those were large numbers given the amount of volume that we were doing. So those were some interesting times. Uh, yes? What's your favorite part of your day-to-day -day role now? Is it high-level strategy, getting down to the gritty sales, or tech? Uh, boy, I mean, there's a lot of things that are good. At, I, I like... Um, I guess it depends. I mean, I, I just came back as an example from uh, a week in California. Uh, since a lot of our venture capital investors are there, we, we sort of alternate. We have board meetings out there and here, and I usually get a lot of meetings around that. And uh, while I was out in California, I met with a lot of uh, you know, potential partners. And so I guess you would call those sales calls, but it's actually pretty exciting. It's pretty invigorating to sort of meet with someone who is interested in your product and, and wants to use it at a large scale. Um, so I find that part uh, uh, you know, I never really, I guess, thought of myself as a salesman, per se, until pretty recently, like in the last year or two. Um, and I realized that I actually think I really like that part of it. Um, I also like the days when I can actually just focus in my office on things. Um, those days are rare, but those are good days, too. Yes? So the, the question is, you know, who were my mentors or people that were my teachers or advice? And um, I had quite a few, but I mean, there was one in particular, a guy named Steve Nelson. Um, and, and, you know, so much of things I look back and just say, gosh, I was extraordinarily lucky. Um, he was uh, a guy who had started his venture capital career three months before he invested in me when I was 18 at the top of that stock market, right? Um, and so, you know, it was his first venture capital investment, <laughs> which is maybe why he invested. Um, but it uh, you know, uh, ended up working out great, though. I mean, by the time we went public, it was a great investment. So he got a, a good win on his first investment. But um, he became my mentor uh, for those first couple of years. You know, I was 18, 19, 20 years old. Uh, we would talk on the phone two or three times a day for years. Um, and he had had, you know, a long career with a number of startups and, and big successful companies. Um, and, and taught me a lot of the organizational skills that were critical, things that you just, I wish they would teach this in school. You know, like uh, I, I, things that I, uh, I just had no way of knowing. Uh, you know, how to sell, how to manage a pipeline, how to lead a team, how to do some of these basic building block things. Uh, so I think, um, and, and I also had a board of directors and an advisory board that I created. Um, and I think, you know, all of those, uh, you know, helped me a, a lot. Definitely, I mean, surround yourself with people. I mean, you, that's, that's, um, you have to be open to coaching, um, and that's so critical. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, sure thing, yeah. So when you're hiring people for technical skills with your product, um, you said you have like entry uh, tests, the programming tests, and uh, let's say fresh college graduates, I assume you also pay attention to maybe, you know, the college has a degree or GPA or something. I was, I was interested in how much attention you pay to either of those or what other factors there might be and then feedback, how, how have those worked out for you? Um, so the question is, you know, uh, all about sort of the hiring process. What kinds of things are we looking for? How do we manage that? And how have the, uh, you know, how, how has it worked out? And look, the first thing is no hiring process is perfect. It's also a two-way street. You know, you might pick brilliantly or incorrectly and vice versa. They might find it's just not the right environment. Um, you know, we measure it in this, this term uh, called attrition. You're sort of looking at your attrition rate, right? But I think that the, the, the hiring process is super critical, especially in the early days. Um, I think once you get into the hundreds of employees, it's, it's harder. But you're trying to maintain uh, a culture that's consistent, 
that's going to work well together, that, that sort of proverbial startup culture. Um, and so the fit is so important. You know, everyone's a little bit different. So the interview process is pretty thorough. We, I think the average employee that comes to us goes through maybe six to eight interviews. Um, and that's beyond the technical test, especially on the technical team. You want to make sure it's a really good gelling. Um, we absolutely look at the resumes. I, I don't think we get into the level of detail around GPA or, or test scores, but in general, we care more about the technical test. And, and we, um, at least with Appia, we aren't doing too much fresh out of school recruiting. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times what's more important to us is the first couple of companies they've worked with out, outside of school. And references are so important. I mean, as you're thinking about your careers, you've got to build upon it and, and have incredible references that are going to back you your whole life, right? That's so, um, it's so easy when you're interviewing. Um, to, I, I learned uh, some early lessons the hard way, not doing references, I guess I'll say. So now we're pretty religious about doing references. And you get to a point where if you're a rock star, it comes through on a reference call, and it's hard to fake it. So I think that's a, a really important thing to be cognizant of. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much.